I'm Paul Crooker, member of the San Francisco Bay Area Alumni Board. Tonight, we are extremely fortunate to have Booth alumnus David Shear sharing his expertise and perspectives on private real estate investing opportunities. David Shear is a co-founder and principal of Origin Investments, where he co-chairs the Investment Committee and oversees investment analyses, acquisition, and asset management. David comes from a family with teacher parents, so he both understands the value of education and the challenges facing families in gaining it. He was a full scholarship football player at Harvard. Later at Chicago Booth, he earned an MBA where he focused on the intersection of real estate, financial modeling, and investment structures. Professionally, David has opened and managed financed hedge funds in the USA and UK, and later was an executive leader as the company president. His success in that role enabled him to focus on real estate. With over two decades in the real estate investing, finance, asset management, David believes that real estate is the best asset class for long-term wealth protection and growth. Outside of his professional life, David has dedicated himself to giving back through leadership and contributions to not-for-profits. David co-founded One Million Degrees, which has raised $20 million to help low-income commu community college students graduate and successfully enter the workforce. He has ser served as the organization's board chair for the last 12 years as the organization has grown from 30 to 1,000 students served per year. He also advises and supports Evans Scholars, the American Diabetes Association, Invest for Kids, and Ronald McDonald House Charities. David also serves as president of the Harvard Club of Chicago. So uh, thank you, David, for giving your time and sharing your expertise with the Booth community tonight. And with that, I'll throw it over to you. Well, thank you very much, Paul. I really appreciate it. That was a very kind introduction. And I'm really looking forward to not only the presentation, but also um, we're going to have this be extraordinarily interactive. Um, I'd like to give you enough that we can start a conversation. And that will happen um, either via the chat function or the Q&A function. And I'm sure everyone on the call is very familiar with this stuff. But um, I'll be able to manage it. So any questions you have, thank you for the four or five questions that were sent prior. Um, I'll address those in the presentation or just literally ask the question and answer it. And then uh, we'll try to be interactive in the last uh, 20 to 25 minutes. So that's me. All right, so let's jump right in. Um, I think before we get to the, the question that's sort of central to this presentation, which is, um, how do we select real estate managers or any managers for that matter of private equity or alternative investments? Because I would pose and I will pose that the same dialectic you're going to use to select a real estate manager would, would apply to any alternative manager. Um, I would actually further pose that you could also apply the same dialectic to public company management teams as well. Um, but let's first start with why private multifamily real estate um, in a portfolio? Why would you want it in the first place? And um, because I know I'm talking to a lot of uh, Booth alums, um, I know that you're very familiar with statistics and um, covariances and correlations. And that's all this um, initial slide is about. Um, because at the end of the day, the expected returns um, of a normal portfolio, which traditionally has been 60% stocks, 40% bonds, um, that expected return has been not only lower than a portfolio that when you sub out um, a little bit of the stock and a little bit of the bonds for multifamily real estate. So your expected return has gone up by roughly 20%, 4.4% to 5.5. Importantly, your standard deviation has gone down, um, standard deviation being a, a proxy for the risk uh, of that portfolio. And then the sharp ratio is nothing more than um, both of those together. So um, a, a lower standard deviation and a higher expected return um, would yield the highest possible sharp ratio. The expected return is always your numerator. The standard deviation is your denominator. Um, so as, as you can just see formulaically, that would, that would always be the case. Now, why does that happen? 
um, it's simply correlation. Um, you, you don't want all of your assets moving in the same direction in a portfolio at the same speed. Um, and so you want to have correlations that um, aren't one. And the, 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 the better you are off is the further you, you move from one. As you can see, multifamily real estate, it doesn't correlate uh, strongly with equities. It correlates inversely with bonds, which is great for a portfolio. Um, and it, it actually doesn't even have that strong of a correlation with, with the public read index. And for those that are uh, following multifamily public REITs, um, we follow them very closely here um, because I'm not only um, I'm not only looking at our own portfolio, um, we have 5,000 units here and another 1,500 in development. So th there's a lot of data we get from that. There's also a lot of data that we get from um, having competitive analysis of our properties across the country. Um, but I also look to the public markets because there's more information there, both in the public earnings of, of multifamily REITs, um, but also the valuations. Um, and right now, there's a tremendous dispersion between public multifamily REIT valuations and the private market. Um, essentially, the public markets are anywhere from 15 to 25% lower than they were at the beginning of the year. And the private markets are unchanged to higher. So it's a very unique time where you, you need to be watching this if you're in the space. But it also corroborates that something as obvious as you would think that private real estate should correlate much higher with public REITs. Um, right now, that's simply not the case at all. And generally, it, it isn't as much as you think. Um, in the Q&A, if someone, I, I'll, I'll kind of get ahead of a question. Someone might ask, well, why, why is that uh, the case? And the answer is the multifamily REITs that make up about 3% of the S&P 500, they get dragged around via the broader market in a way that privates wouldn't. And so not only is the correlation not what you think, but there's also way more volatility in the multifamily REIT space for that reason. So before we start talking about um, how you're going to select a multifamily manager, if I've convinced you that um, multifamily, and, and, and incidentally, I didn't cover the duration, but that data is based on 20 years. It's, it's the last 20 years of data. And so I can pose, um, and, and I will, that for the last 20 years, multifamily in a portfolio has raised your sharp ratio by lowering your standard deviation and increasing your expected return. Okay, so if you believe that um, you want to add multifamily portfolio, then the next question is, do you want to have a professional manager or do you want to do it yourself? And when we're talking about um, why, when you're thinking about, do I want to do it myself or do I want to have a manager? Um, a few things to think about um, in the do-it-yourself camp. Uh, the first is, do you actually have the expertise to do this well? Um, I actually don't know how to fix my car. I, I could learn, but I don't. As some, I, I actually outsource that to somebody else. Um, there's a familiarity with multifamily investment that people um, oftentimes think because they've rented in the past or they own a home or uh, they know people who've done this, et cetera, that they can buy a building and rent it and do it well. Um, and it's interesting to me because um, I was talking to Paul prior and he was kind enough to read my bio. I also reviewed his. And Paul has experience in, um, in energy as his career. And um, one of his areas of expertise is um, nuclear waste removal. And, and how many people on this call would, would decide to create a business in nuclear waste removal? Probably none, because they feel there's too big of a varied entry. They don't really understand it. It's high risk. But for some reason with multifamily, everyone wants to roll their sleeves and do it. And it actually can be a huge trap. Um, number one, do you really understand how to value a multifamily property? Have you been trained in it? Um, are, are you trained in finance? Are you trained in defensible inputs? Um, are you trained in operations? Are you trained in technology? Um, do you have infrastructure? And, and, and that's the expertise side that you, you need to just ask those questions. Some on this call probably are. 
and, and they fit all those boxes, um, but an awful lot of people aren't. Um, in terms of concentration risk, if you want to develop a portfolio of multifamily, you, you don't want to own one asset. I mean, that's just, that's portfolio theory, right, right down the fairway, right? So um, if someone on the call said they want to invest in the stock market, no one on the call would think that buying one stock is an investment strategy. But for some reason in real estate investment, people oftentimes wind up in one or two deals and, and that's not, um, that's not a, a viable strategy. Is the quality of the real estate when you're doing it yourself institutional? Is it of high quality? Can it, can it hold value over a decade or two decades or three decades? Um, is it large enough to give you economies of scale? Um, oftentimes people, you know, some of our, our clients uh, at Origin are very large family offices. And even family offices that have hundreds of millions of dollars of capital, if they're going to have 20% of that be real estate, you're down to 40 million. That can be one or two assets of institutional quality. So you, again, you're not getting the diversification and that's with people who have a lot of capital right so it's another consideration and then and then the obvious uh is time um so even if all those things uh, were satisfied those questions the answer becomes the question is where do you want to spend your time um how much do you value your time and when you're looking at an equation and you're balancing it are you including time in, in that do you want to spend your leisure time collecting rent or fixing sinks um, and the stress that comes with it. So I'm gonna move to uh, David Svensson, who's uh, someone I'm sure a lot of people on the call understand. The work that he's done at the Yale Endowment, um, I can tell you that uh, he's trounced uh, Harvard for the last 25 years um, and Harvard consistently changes um, I'll say our, because I'm, I'm somewhat involved. We, we change our investment strategy, trying to uh, catch up with what he's done uh, because he's bridged the gap in the endowment. Uh, it used to be huge and now he's neck and neck with us because he's beaten us by two to 300 basis points over 25 years and that compounding effect is enormous. And so how has he done it? Um, because I'm, I'm segueing into, um, if people believe that within real estate, they want to have managers do it, not themselves. Um, that's his secret sauce, is manager selection. Now, if you read his books, um, and I'm sure many of you have, I have, um, his simple thesis is in all beta markets, go to the lowest cost provider, right? So if you, if you want S&P exposure, go to the lowest fee provider of that beta, um, et cetera. But he also believes in um, oversized allocations to alternatives. And he's, he's really the vanguard of that uh, movement. And, and he has plenty of people he's um, worked with over the years that have moved into other endowments. Um, I actually saw him speak, I believe it was in 2003. Uh, so quite a while ago now. And he had just completed a book and, and afterwards, um, he was signing books and, and I said to him, I said, um, I said, Mr. Swenson, I, I appreciate what you said, but you, you, you didn't answer the, the one question that really I want answered, which is how do you select managers? Because, you know, you're saying that's where you can really get the alpha in your portfolio. Um, you need to find those best managers for alternatives. And he smiled and said, you know, I have a lot of resources at Yale and that's our secret sauce. And he's not going to share that. You know, he has a process um, and, and that's what's not in his books. Um, I am going to share that uh, because I feel like I've spent the last 15 years trying to answer that question. And in becoming a manager myself, um, it's interesting because uh, a lot of the questions that I'm asking are obviously asked of me um, really on a, on a monthly basis. Uh, so um, I really see it from both sides. So how do you evaluate a private real estate manager? Um, the, the first thing I would look at is their investment strategy. 
um, understand your unique approach, in this case, to real estate investing. Um, the first red flag, um, if you're going to uh, evaluate any real estate manager, in my opinion, is you don't, you really don't want the, the strategy to be broad and encompassing. Um, I would shy away from real estate managers, fund managers who are multi-strat or really all real estate. Um, opportunistic funds, oftentimes they can invest in multifamily, office, hotel, industrial, um, data centers, self-storage, you know, it goes on and on and on. And um, I'm of the opinion that uh, um, just, just like private equity, um, I want to see people with deep domain experience. So from a strategy standpoint, my lens is um, it's no different than uh, venture or private equity, real estate's no different. I want to see um, decades of experience in one vertical, um, which has yielded consistent returns um, with defensible competitive advantages going forward. Um, and I don't believe that's possible with one exception, by the way, uh, Blackstone is big enough um, that they can be multi-strat and they are, um, but they're purely a joint venture because you can't, you can't invest uh, tens of billions of dollars and that's what they're investing. They're so big, they have to joint venture on every deal. There's nothing wrong with that, um, except for the fact that uh, it's very diluted. Right. So, you, you know, when you invest in a fund that's a joint venture fund, um, you're getting promoted and you're paying management fees at the deal level and also the fund level. And that doesn't mean it won't work. It just means the deals have to be incredibly uh, high margin in order for you to, to, to wind up with your 15 to 20 percent because it's it's you know, you're, you're getting Nick 20, 25 percent twice. So let's talk about competitive advantages because now you're actually interfacing with managers and, and you're interested, right? So at this point, um, you've decided that you are interested in real estate in your portfolio. You don't want to do it yourself. And, and, and now you're starting to see materials um, for various funds um, or perhaps you're, you're talking to, to managers. Um, the number one thing you should ask them is what their competitive advantages are and, and, and it should be within a frame. So the frame in your mind is because there's a life cycle to, to private equity or venture even. I mean, it, it's always the same. There's an acquisition phase, there's an operational phase and there's a risk management phase and there's a disposition phase. And throughout that life cycle of the investment, that manager has to be able to tell you what their competitive advantages are and, and what the evidence is that, that they exist, right? So the obvious evidence is consistency, consistency of returns, right? So how many, how many deals have you done? Um, are there are a lot of zeros and a lot of five X's and you wind up with two X um, that suggests there's a lot of risk or do you have a heck of a lot of two X's that suggests sort of a consistent process that, that tends to bear the returns you want. So I don't want to make this about origin. I won't, but you can certainly ask me in, in all of these questions if you want in the Q and A, because these are the lenses that I have to be answering for. Um, I will say at, at origin, my answer for acquisitions is um, we're unique in the sense that um, we have four offices across the country and all of our people are integrated and live in their cities where we invest. And, and so because of that, we have deeper relationships, deeper knowledge. And we, we obviously, you know, when you hear things like, oh, we have a, we're data driven and we have AI and that's true. We have it too, but real estate is also still about relationships and um, you need to have both. Uh, I don't believe that sitting in a, in a office in Chicago with great AI is enough. Um, and so I believe that's one of our competitive advantages. The question would be, well, what's the evidence? And I would tell you the evidence is of 58 deals we've done over the last 10 years, 52% have been off market. And that's 
always a good thing because off market means it's less competitive, which means I'm buying it at better pricing with more inefficiency, right? And that's what you want on the way in. Um, once you turn it around, you want it to be broadly marketed on the way out and, and capture every potential buyer. Um, and, and by the way, I won't, but I could, I can answer the same question for operations. I could answer the same question for risk management. And, and that's what you want to do with your interview process of a manager is create a frame, right? The frame is the life cycle of the investment acquisitions. How are you building operations that can be EBITDA and, and a private equity firm? It's, it's called net operating income for us. But what are you doing to build it and, and why are you better than others and how do you measure a benchmark? Right. And then you can do the same thing with risk management. Um, and you can do the same thing, obviously, with dispositions. Um, that frame will serve you well. So alignment is important. Um, and this is another, it's just a really easy question to ask um, any, any private equity or real estate or venture manager is how much are you investing in your funds and, and how does this alignment um, cascade and flow down the firm, right? And so if you have a highly aligned firm, you'll see that the principals are investing significantly into the fund, but then you'll also see that the key team members are incented by the fund being successful and perhaps they also own um, stock in the, in the fund or in the firm. And then the way to measure that, um, one of the ways to measure it is how good are they at retaining the key members of their team, right? So again, to answer it for origin, we have um, 32 team members. Of, of that, there are um, roughly 16 members that are critical, uh, meaning they, they report up to either me or my partner, Michael, and lead divisions, whether it's acquisitions, whether it's acquisitions, operations, technology, communications, accounting. And, and so those, those folks you want to put a moat around, especially if you think they're of high quality. And the way you would measure that as an investor is simply saying, how long have they been at origin? Um, I see that your returns are good, but are they the same people that were producing them before? And it's a very objective question. And um, that's what you want when you're, when you're evaluating a manager. Um, another objective question would be um, within the realm of alignment, because it matters um, how scale matters, right? So if I say, okay, we have a $200 million fund and we're aligned with you, we invested a million dollars. It's true you're aligned, but if we had invested $10 million, we're more aligned and that's better, right? You, you want your manager to be as aligned as possible. So this, this slide is really about business risk, right? So when you're investing in any fund, um, and by the way, we haven't covered deal by deal investing. That's another way to invest in real estate. Perhaps we can, we can do that. Um, you would evaluate the management team of a deal the same way you would as a fund. I'm focusing on funds because I believe in diversification in a portfolio. I, I generally don't like, especially people that don't have a real estate portfolio to go deal by deal because they tend to wind up too concentrated in one asset or two assets. Um, but it, it, it's absolutely something people do. Um, but when you're doing that, whether you're evaluating a, a real estate fund or a real estate deal, you need to first focus on the viability of that business concern. You know, a, a real estate fund is anywhere from, you know, five to 10 years, just as a private equity uh, fund is in duration. And so you also have to be confident that that business, the private equity firm itself, the real estate firm itself, is viable and has you know cash flows and, and risk management and, and is, is a going concern, right? So one of the things that you should be doing, um, especially when you're talking about um, firms that are younger, right? I would say origin is sort of medium. We're, we're 13 uh, years old now, um, but there are firms that are 50 years old, right? And, and I would say we're kind of in the middle, but, but if you're going with a, a newer company, it's a real risk 
that's out there. Um, what happens if they don't have cash flows and now you're stuck in a fund where they can't retain their key people? Um, and, and all of a sudden you start getting management that's not what you'd hoped for. So when you're evaluating a, a, a real estate manager, um, risk management and mitigation is something that you absolutely should look into. And so the, the easiest thing uh, to look at uh, as far as risk, because it's objective again, um, you don't need deep domain knowledge is debt to equity levels. So, you know, at origin, we use 60 to 65% debt on our deals. Um, some of our competitors might use that. Some of them might use 75, some might use 80. I've written articles on this. Um, if you are interested in the quantitative side, um, there are ways to quantify debt to equity levels and the required return on equity relative to debt levels. Um, it's an equation that can be balanced. It's math. And, and often uh, at times, um, even sophisticated experienced investors make the mistake of not understanding how much the retired return on equity needs to go up as debt goes up because it's exponential. So if I said to you, um, hey, we have a deal and um, let's just make it tangible. It's a, uh, it's a value add deal, um, class A minus multifamily in uh, uptown Dallas. And here's our business plan. And we're gonna use 62% leverage. And you know, here's the model and, and you go in and you, you can quantify the model and you have the ability to look at the defensibility of the inputs because you have domain knowledge of the various inputs, rent growth, cap rate drift, um, whatever it is that, that's in that model that, that you need to understand what moves value. Um, and, and you say, yeah, okay, that, that's reasonable. And the re expected return is 13%. And then someone else presents a deal and says, same deal. You know, maybe it's a block away, but everything is similar. Um, but they're not using 62% debt. They're using 80% debt. And they're offering an 18% return. And you say, oh, well, a lot of people would rather do that. And I would tell you because the, it, it's just an equation. Um, you need to get a lot more than 18% um, as a risk adjusted return moving from 62 to 80 because it's exponential, the return that's required on equity relative to debt to equity levels. And the reason I'm telling you this is especially if you go deal by deal, that happens a lot. And I don't necessarily think that the managers are trying to deceive the investor. I, I actually don't think they understand it either. So they wind up because they, they really can't raise enough equity. So they keep using more and more debt because now they only need to raise 5 million, not 8 million. That's really what's driving it. But the investor on the other side eventually is the one that got in at 90% leverage and they're offered a 20% return and that's a horrific expected value risk adjusted. So spend a lot of time on debt to equity levels in real estate. Um, it's a tangible asset. And if you're in the right asset class, multifamily is one of them that's viewed as essential. Um, lenders will lend a lot um, and, and that exposes equity to a lot of risk. Um, I should say, because I didn't earlier, um, multifamily over the last 40 years um, has been the highest returning, um, highest sharp ratio asset in real estate. And it also does um, extraordinarily well in downturns, including this one, um, because it's an essential asset, right? So right now we're being outperformed as an asset class by industrial um, and also data centers and towers. And th that's due to the secular move in the economy. I mean, there, there's a massive move towards um, that space, right? Um, whether it's the gig economy or um, the warehouses necessary to execute, you know, the Amazon uh, takeover of retail. But that's a secular move. What's interesting about uh, multifamily is it, it, it's an essential good that just keeps chugging along. Um, 
and, and I view it as um, there's a moat. Uh, there's no way to disrupt it. <clears throat> so a great question to ask a real estate manager is what, what is your worst deal? And, um, you know, for us, it's different for every manager. Um, our worst deal was in 2012. Um, we bought an asset extraordinarily well, um, but it came with uh, a management team that we thought we vetted, but didn't. And uh, it turned out they weren't very good at uh, operations and um, they also weren't ethical. And so when I took over the management um, and removed them, um, we turned it around and sold it and we made some money, but not a lot. Um, I think we made a 9% return, uh, but the multiple was terrible. It was, this whole thing happened in one year. So it was a 109 multiple and the opportunity cost was enormous uh, because that was a time in 2013 where valuations were low and you really should be making, you know, twenties or higher on all your money. And, and we did. Um, so that's the worst deal that Origin's done in, in the last 10 years. Um, and there were learnings. Um, when we vet managers, we thought we had a process, we executed it, but obviously we didn't make the right decision. So at that point, you've got to reevaluate. Um, so whoever you're evaluating as a manager, they need to be able to speak to, everyone has a worse deal, right? And they need to tell you about what went wrong in an honest way. And everyone on this uh, webinar is smart enough to know when someone is telling the truth or not, probably. Um, and it, 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 you'll learn a lot. Um, it's a good question to ask. So in real estate investing, um, risk management is so important because if you're buying the right asset classes, I, I believe multifamily is one of them, um, and you're buying the right assets in the right cities, in the right neighborhoods, um, these assets go up over time. Um, every single 10 year period for the last 50 years, you've made good money in multifamily real estate. But in between, you have to have a management team that can both build EBITDA, again, we call it NOI, but same difference, and manage risk, right? Because the, we talked about debt to equity. Um, if you use too much debt, you can lose an asset. I mean, it doesn't take a lot, right? If, if there's a five, 10% correction, which can happen, you're levered at 90%, you're not covering debt, right? You're not making payments, you can't refi, you're at risk. Um, but there are other risks, right? There's, there's the risk that your manager doesn't, doesn't really know how to build um, NOI. They don't really know how to integrate the physical with the virtual because you know, in multifamily real estate right now, it's become much more complex. Um, there is no difference between the virtual and the physical world. And, and I'll, I'll tell you what I mean. When a renter who's your client actually makes the decision that they want to rent, the first thing they do is go to the ratings, right? And so the ratings are controlled by Google, they're controlled by apartments.com. And when they go there, if you don't have four or five star ratings, they're not even going to take the next step, which is to go to your website, which is also virtual, by the way. So like, not only do you have to be winning in the ratings, but you also have to have an interactive um, website that doesn't just show the property, but shows how that renter can experience it. And that starts to segue into social media and the use of the property. And so you need to have a manager that, that understands all of these things. The, the confluence of the virtual, the physical, and, and it's, a, it's a virtuous circle because you can't get good ratings unless you have a great physical asset and great service. That's what shows up in the ratings in the first place. Um, it's, it's strangely efficient, um, to be honest, because if, if you're not doing your job, it's, it's pretty transparent. There's no way to improve ratings. But if you don't improve ratings, there's no way to actually improve occupancy and, and drive rent. So another really easy thing to do is referrals. Um, and if a manager has been around long enough, you can also start to measure it, right? So 
at Origin, um, we've been measuring this for a long time. Um, 70% of our clients reinvest in another fund. Um, I don't know. I, I haven't ever benchmarked that. I don't know. Maybe another manager can say it's, well, great. We're 80%. I, I have no idea. But I, I know that 70% is pretty high, which means that generally um, clients have a good experience here in terms of returns and service. Um, but from a referral standpoint, even if the manager is relatively new, um, all of them have had deals and funds prior. And you should ask them for referrals. What, what's better than a referral is um, for you to um, find people who have worked with the manager that they're not using as a referral, right? In the same way that when you're hiring, um, referrals are, are useful. What's more useful is to find someone through your network that actually worked with that person or knows that person. And it's sort of a unsolicited referral. That, that's where you might get even better information. If a manager is not willing to give you a referral um, of a client um, to talk to, um, that's a red flag. Um, you, you probably should pass at that point. Oh, one last thing. Uh, it is a good idea to actually also talk to not just the principal. If you want to start um, vetting a management team, you probably also want to talk to key people. So it's not enough just to talk to me. Maybe you should talk to my head of acquisitions and my head of operations, et cetera. And you can measure the culture of the firm and the activities of the firm through the consistency of those conversations. Um, so that's all I have. I actually am right on time. Uh, they told me 7.45, so I'm a little bit early, which is great. And I'm now going to check on the live questions. But um, before I do, um, some of you uh, sent in questions. Um, thank you. So I'm going to uh, I'm going to address those now. Um, the first question was, uh, "What is your method for quantifying risk?" Um, and I spent a lot of time um, talking about that to equity. Um, but I I, I also want to uh, point out another way that um, you can quantify risk with a management team. But it does require some domain knowledge. Um, so we learn an awful lot through the way people underwrite deals. Um, so for example, when we underwrite a deal, whether it's a development deal or a value add deal um, or a core plus deal, um, we spend a lot of time on starting rents and concessions in the market and effective rents um, and the defensibility of where we, we're going to start rents in our model because it's a huge driver of value for that deal long term. You know, if you're wrong about where you start rents the wrong way, it's like pushing a rock uphill for five years. So you really got to get that part of it. Um, and then you build in um, cushion where you can win. Right, so if I start, let's say I'm right about starting rents, um, but typically there's a value add or some revenue enhancing component to the business plan, um, that has to be defensible, right? So if I believe that we can invest $4,000 per unit and get 20% uh, unlevered return and capital investment, why is that defensible? Based on what, right? And so that would be something to look at. Um, and then from a valuation standpoint, how much am I growing rents just year over year because that's what we believe, no value add, what will happen in the market. And, you know, historically, uh, firms in, in multifamily real estate generally use um, two and a half to three percent. Um, now people have moved on to, uh, you know, national databases like RealPage and others, uh, CoStars and others. Um, to break it down by city and or submarket. Um, at Origin, we use some of those databases, but we also have our own AI that um, also quantifies it based on uh, data inputs. And, and we also benefit from owning a lot of the market and, and experiencing that um, data in real time. Um, but the defensibility of that rent growth is a, is a huge 
consideration because if, if you're looking at a model, I can tell you this, any five-year model, when you have a 4% rent growth is going to work as a model, but that doesn't mean it's going to work as an investment. Uh, that's a very aggressive assumption. So it, when you see assumptions that are aggressive, you should work up. Um, it's going to be hard to deliver that. Um, the last thing is we drift our cap rates in the model. So if the going cap rate right now in Denver is, is four and a half uh, based on that submarket, that, that asset quality, we're building in um, essentially a 2% a year or five-year model. So at the end of that period, we're using a five, a five cap uh, to cap our um, NOI in year five. That just builds in cushion because, and if the deal still works, that means that we can get some stuff wrong because I can promise you every model you see is not going to be accurate, including ours. It's the best assumptions you can make at a point in time and then life ensues and you have to deliver a business plan. And so the, my only point is you learn a lot from underwriting, um, how people view the world and risk management through that lens. And if you're looking at models that have aggressive assumptions throughout and then also don't drift cap rates. Um, it suggests that that manager probably is over promising um, at that point. It's going to be difficult for those things to happen. Not impossible, difficult. Uh, another question we had was, um, where do you get your sources for rent at? I sort of answered that. Um, for us, it's a combination of our own portfolio um, RealPage, CoStar, and another uh, national database called Radix. Um, each is different. Uh, I would say Radix is probably the best because you can actually go down to the property level of your competitive set. So when I'm looking at, for example, my operations team, I can use Radix to benchmark our operational performance against whatever property sets that I deem are um, the ones competing with us um, for occupancy, renewal rate, rent, rent growth, et cetera. Uh, I had another question about return on investment, a value add. Um, how do we quantify it? Um, well, the quantifying is, it is easy, right? That's just math. But um, generally, we don't want to do any value add that doesn't do at least 16% uh, unlevered. Um, and so the value add can be anything from a full redo of a unit, which is anywhere from ten dollars to $15,000 to just a component. Um, we're just replacing the, replacing the lights or we're just adding a backsplash or we're just redoing the floors or we're just doing fixtures. Um, and we, we can measure that. And, and oftentimes in value add, what you really need to be aware of is what's the affordability ratio of the property? And as it approaches 30%, meaning that the existing rents already are 30% of the income of the renters, um, you should be very careful about value adds uh, because they, they really don't have the ability to pay. So you might be increasing the value of property, but if they can't pay more, that, that doesn't work, right? And, and the way that you, you win is you test these things. Right? So my answer to how do we quantify in actuality is at all of our properties, the new ones, but also the existing ones, we'll test three or four units and, and we'll do a backsplash and we'll see. Uh, um, are people willing to spend an extra $70 a month for that? Because it only costs $1,000 to do and, and your payback is essentially a year. That makes sense, right? I mean, so, so you test these things. Um, the more value add you can do and get paid for it, obviously the better, right? So if, if I can do 5,000 value add that's at 18%, that's way better than 1,000 value add at 25%, right? Because it's 18% of a, a much larger number, which then can be capitalized too on exit. Our last question was, how do I quantify the political risk? Um, I can tell you a lot of our clients um, are hyper focused on this right now. Um, one of our funds is a qualified opportunity zone fund. And there's been a tremendous amount of uh, capital that's flown into that fund in the last few months because people are 
nervous that um, that entire program might be you know reevaluated and they might change the maps and you know who knows what. I, I, but all of these types of questions, um, my answer is always the same. Uh, I don't get paid to do that, right? I get paid to outperform my competitors to build value to our properties, to, to keep our heads down doing what we do. Um, I don't know how to invest based on any of those types of questions. Um, I think multifamily will be good in, in any environment, but I have to be very good with our team at maximizing value. Okay, I'm moving on to, let me see here. I can't see what's going on here. Let me escape this, maybe. Try this. Okay, there we go, got it. These are the live questions. Um, all right, I'm gonna read them. I actually haven't seen them until now, so bear with me. Um, as a recent alumni that has limited capital, how would you recommend getting started? Um, I actually think that if you have limited capital, because um, funds like ours and most real estate private equity funds, you have to be accredited um, to be an investment partner. Um, and so that would mean that you need uh, 200,000 of annual income or a million dollars net worth. And so people who are just starting out, I actually believe that um, public apartment REITs are traditionally a, a, a very good option for you. And that would be my answer. Um, I would do a portfolio. I wouldn't just buy one stock, but um, some of the, some of the public apartment REITs that I like, um, if you want West coast exposure, I like uh, Avalon Bay. Um, I like Essex. Um, Avalon Bay is ABB, Essex is ESS. Um, if you want coastal exposure, um, I think equity residential, they have both West Coast and East Coast and DC. Um, those stocks have been hit really hard, all of those stocks, because of their exposure to California and in equity residential's case, uh, New York and California. Um, if you want uh, exposure to the markets that Origin invests in, which is essentially the Southeast, Texas, and the Southwest, um, I like Camden, CPT. Um, I also like MAA, but I would buy a portfolio. Um, and in my opinion, uh, you, you probably want, now understand you're already getting 3% via the S&P. So if you have a bunch of invested in the S&P, you're already getting some exposure to these stocks. Um, but historically REIT stocks, and in particular multifamily REIT stocks, have outperformed the S&P. Um, over long periods of time. And so I would pose that you want to have more exposure to this asset class and they're, they're deeply discounted right now. So I think that's a wonderful uh, option. Uh, and thanks for your question. Second question, um, on these real estate deals, is there cross collateration debt? Um, great question. And uh, I really appreciate you answering or asking it because I didn't cover this. Um, so when you're looking at a manager in a fund, um, it's really important that uh, you ask the question, do you cross collateralize your debt? Um, and if the answer is yes, just simply don't invest in the fund. You're taking on a risk that's, that's outsized and it's not, um, it's not good risk management. So it, it says a lot about the manager's risk management in general. So in our funds, no, absolutely not. We never cross collateralize. Each asset is in its own SPE with a non-recourse loan. And so, no, but the funds that you wanna invest in also should have a structure where the manager isn't paid their incentive fee until you have all of your equity returned and your preferred equity uh, that you've earned returned before they are paid any incentive fee. So what you want is non-cross collateralization of debt but you want full cross collateralization of your equity. So, so for example, in our funds, if we have 15 deals and one of them does really, really well and two of them don't, then I don't get paid 
because you didn't, I didn't do well enough as a whole, right? But other funds, and it's a good, it, there's a second question you need to ask is, do you have cross collateralized promotes? You want that as an investor, or do you do deal by deal promote? You don't want that because in the, in the example I just laid out, you could have, if I had a deal that did really well and two that didn't, I would actually receive my promote on the deal that did really well. And then the other two like, Oh, well, I still get paid on the one, right? You don't want that as an investor. You want me to be in it on every deal with you. How am I thinking about counterparty risk in multifamily due to COVID? Also, how are you thinking about initial data suggesting people are leaving large cities? Um, well, well, look, we're not in the large cities. Uh, I, I'm, I don't, I said this before, we're not in California, we're not in New York, we're not in Boston. Um, generally the cities that, that are uh, struggling, we're, we're not in, but it's happening. Um, and my opinion is that um, there's, there's a subset, I don't want to say how big it is, I don't know, but there's a subset, it, it isn't stigmatized anymore, and I, I don't believe will be, to work virtually. And so that means that there's less of a premium than there used to be living in San Fran and New York, et cetera, because you don't have to live there to work there as much. Um, and it, I think it's really powerful because not only is it lower cost for the labor, um, and in some cases, um, you know, there's cities that they might rather live, but, but couldn't, but it's also really uh, beneficial for the owner of the company, right? So when, when uh, Mark Zuckerberg announced that he wants 50% of Facebook to be, you know, virtual in the next few years, the way I processed that was he's trying to save on costs because you know, in the beginning, labor is going to uh, benefit because they're going to get the same salaries, but in a lower cost city. But eventually what's going to happen is he's going to pay less because they're in a lower cost city. And, and I, I just think it's a very, uh, it's a very powerful thing. And it's kind of left the station at this point. So then the public markets are suggesting that um, the publicly traded REITs that um, are really hit partner REITs are the ones with coastal exposure. That's because the market believes this isn't just a disruption. This is a secular move where there's slightly less demand in these cities that will be enduring. I don't know if that'll happen or not, uh, but it's certainly happening. Um, there, there's no denying that. Do you see much real estate tech being deployed in properties? Um, an unbelievable amount. Um, it, it's anything from the virtual, which I touched on. So just to give you an example, um, uh, about a year ago, um, we implemented, um, virtual tours and virtual leasing at all of our properties. And, and the reason we did it was, uh, we just thought it was a way to enhance leasing. Um, because there's a lot of people pre COVID that, you know, they, they want a tour, but maybe they don't have time and, 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 you know, how different is it walking a unit versus having a, uh, someone at the property walk the unit for you and virtually describe the unit? Um, it's not as good, but it's, it's not so bad either. So then when COVID hit, uh, that became the standard because you, you couldn't do physical tours. Um, and so COVID within our space um, has consolidated five years of technology growth into six months. Um, and you have to keep up uh, in order to compete. Um, it's another reason um, the do-it-yourselfers are, you know, they're struggling because it, it's it's very difficult to keep up with all the, and, and that's just on the revenue side. There, there's expense size technology as well um, that, that's constantly coming in the, in the space. And then there's also spatial. Um, I, I wouldn't, is it technology? I'm not sure, but um, you know, for example, in our, in our smaller units, we're doing um, beds that also convert into drawers and, and storage, but also converts into a desk. And so now you have this multifunctional space. So if you have six, 700 foot unit, that, that's very interesting. And so back to measuring value add and return on equity, 
you're doing the same equation with that, but it, it's not the unit, it's actually F, F, and E, right? It, it's a furniture element. Um, and so that, that's an example of spatial innovation um, that, that also is you know, becoming more of a, um, it, it's, it's more of an investment because when people are working virtually in smaller spaces, they need to get more out of their spaces. Okay, the next question. Uh, thanks for the insight. Do you have any foresight into the CRE deleveraging cycle? Um, what it might look like for less COVID resilient assets such as retail and hospitality? Yes. Um, so within um, multifamily, I haven't seen really any distress. And when I, when I say that, I'm talking about Class A, well-located multifamily. That's what we do. Um, that's not to say that there's not distress in smaller assets, worse cities, et cetera. Um, but there really hasn't been. But, but in retail and hospitality, there's, there's a tremendous amount. Um, and and it's, it's not going to stop. Um, and by the way, and for, for retail, COVID was an accelerant, but it was already happening. You know, retail has underperformed and been a tough, tough asset class for the last you know, five years. Um, and the reality is in the U.S., we have too much retail. It, it, you know, we have two times more retail than Europe per capita. It, it just isn't necessary. And so a lot of this is just um, reinventing and you know, cleansing what probably was overbuilt. Um, hospitality, I think, is, um, I think it's going to struggle um, in the same way that office is going to struggle because um, I believe that there's a secular move here. Um, business trips are going to be replaced by, you know, Zoom and team seminars. And they're not as good, but man, are they more convenient and cheaper. And so you're going to permanently lose some segment of what used to be the hospitality, you know, sort of lifeblood. And uh, same, same with retail. I, I just see it as an accelerant. Office, same thing. Um, I don't believe that office will ever um, have the full demand it used to. Um, and remember, it doesn't take a lot of demand to create enormous moves in valuation and disruption, right? So let's talk about retail. How much retail is actually brick and mortar still? Somewhere between 84, 87%. So with that 12 to 15% market share that Amazon and, and the virtual took, look at the carnage, right? It doesn't take a lot. And, and it's going to keep coming. It, it's not going to stop. It, it's cheaper and it's, it's more convenient for the consumer. Well, for office, it's cheaper, right? And, and, and by the way, when I'm talking about office, we own some office buildings now. I'm talking about, some, I own office and I'm telling you, I, I, I'm selling it. Um, I have 200 contract now. I'm going to keep selling it. The space has changed. That, that's the one it was doing fine. And you, you might talk to other managers who say, well, no, I, I believe that, you know, in a, in a COVID or even post COVID world, office is going to need more space and therefore, you know, more separation, et cetera. Um, I think that they're kidding themselves. Uh, that that's not, it, it's a valid argument, but it's just not as powerful as the counter argument. So we're, we're a seller of office space um, and we'll be out of that very, very soon. Um, how do new investors join one of your funds, existing LLCs, and how do they exit? Um, our funds are all uh, open-ended. And so you can, we only have two active funds. Um, one is a value add and core plus multifamily uh, fund, and the other is a qualified opportunity zone fund. Both of those funds um, accept capital on a monthly basis, um, and we float both share prices. And so every month uh, we, we do the NOIs and um, the valuations and we roll it up to a share price. So it's, it's easy to join and it's, um, you know, it's something that we take a lot of consideration in terms of the valuations. 
Um, I'm running over, I know, 801. I'm trying to get everyone's questions. Uh, you mentioned Blackstone is the only firm. Sorry, this is moving. Where is it? Oh, here it is. To invest across verticals because they have scale. Do you think there's an argument to be made because Blackstone is so large, they aren't able to be as selective? Um, I, I, I hold Blackstone in high regard. They've done a great job and they've returned a lot of, an, of returns to their clients. So I, I can't, uh, I think they have some competitive advantages because they own a lot, they have good information. They can do large portfolio deals, um, you know, because they have the size and scale to do them. Um, I think we're better than them, but I also think they're very good. So I, I don't, um, have anything but good things to say about them. Um, how do you think about your firm's core competencies with regards to acquisition and operations? Um, which drives returns? You know, to me, and those are the two teams I manage, acquisitions and operations. Um, they both drive returns. I, I know you want me to pick. Um, there are certain instances where you can buy a property so well that it's probably more important than operations. But there's others where, you know, you, you got a good buy, but maybe you, you bought at 2% below the market and you're going to have to really win in operations to drive more value. So they're both really important. Um, I can tell you in the last six months, um, operations have been the most important. Um, and, and, and it's, uh, you know, in a way it, it's, it's, I would say most real estate private equity firms um, put an overemphasis on acquisitions and COVID has really leveled the playing field because now you have such disruption and, and those hardworking people in operations are really valued. And so that, that's probably been one of the nice things about COVID is that leveling. Um, can you discuss how you see risk and return in private versus public markets? How do you quantify how investors should be compensated? Um, yeah, so, so there is, you should be compensated more for a private investment because it's not as liquid, right? So um, how would I do that? Uh, I think, and I don't want to speak out of turn, uh, but I believe the historic return on public U.S. stocks, larger cap has been somewhere in the seven and a half to eight and a half range. And please uh, text me if you think I'm wrong. Um, now, you also have to take into consideration debt equity levels of those public stocks, because I can tell you that um, historically we've returned over 20 percent. So obviously there's a big spread. But I also told you earlier that we're using 60 to 65 percent leverage. It could be that we're using way more leverage than the public reads. In fact, I know we are. They use roughly um, 45 to 50%. So we're using slightly more leverage to get those returns. Um, but there should be a premium for sure. Um, if you're getting the same return in, in uh, privates as you are in publics, I would say you, you should just be in publics. Uh, last question, because I'm over. Um, Oh, here's a good one. Um, what's your take on crowdfunded real estate investing like Fundrise? Um, I think that uh, crowdfunding, it, it's, it's moved around a lot. I mean, in the beginning, Fundrise, since you mentioned them, um, they were a two-sided market. They had a bunch of people who had deals on one side and they were trying to attract investors on the other and they were taking a cut. Um, on a deal by deal basis of putting those two groups together. Um, Realty Mogul is another example of that. I didn't like that model at all um, because there's no alignment. Um, you know, the, there's no real alignment or expertise. And uh, from an investor standpoint, um, you're not getting diversification. Um, you're, you're just doing deal by deal, which I generally don't like. Um, I don't think most investors are trained enough. It's not that they're not smart. I, I just don't think they're trained enough to, to understand what a good deal is versus an average deal. So that made, I didn't like that model. Um, I can tell you that Fundrise has 
moved more to a fund management model. Um, and so now they're offering funds. I think they still offer deals too, but I, I believe they offer funds or REIT products um, where they're the manager. And so then at that point, um, I would need to underwrite their management team as we went over today, right? So how are, what are their competitive advantages? How do they manage risk? What are their historic returns? All the things we talked about, what, what's their structures, right? Do they have cross-collateralized debt, cross-collateralized promotes? All of those things you need to do with Fundrise. I mean, just because you have a crowdfunding model doesn't mean you don't use the same dialectic uh, that we talked about. You would use it in every direction. Thank you very much. I know the debate is starting, so I've probably lost most of you, and I actually want to watch it too. Um, Thanks, David. You did a great job sharing the, your depth of knowledge. Just fascinating. We got the video. You can go over it a few times, and um, you have David's contact information. It was in the slide. You know, if you if you have questions, reach out to him. And thanks again. It it was a, a great uh, discussion. Well, thank, thank you. you. And I appreciate the invitation. Have a great night. Good night.